All right. So now we'll get up to the official stuff. This is the last lecture in this class. There will be another class meeting, but it's a guest speaker. So if you look here, um, where's, we're not going to finish all of chapter four. This is going to get about halfway through chapter four tonight, and that's as far as we're going to get. And next week we have Jason Chang as a guest lecturer, and that's it. Then there's just final exams. I know a lot of students have begun to sign up for classes next semester, but I think everything is going to change. This Wednesday, they will cut another 200 classes and presumably fire a lot more teachers because they balanced the budget by pretending they could just impound money from a federal grant and put it in the coffers, and any of us could have told them, you can't do that. So they figured out last week that they can't do that, so now they have to cut the budget a lot more. So something ridiculous is going to happen this Wednesday. We have a meeting. I'll let you know if they tell me anything. But I, I, I imagine most of the classes that you, many of the classes that you see offered that you're signing up for are probably not going to happen. Everything's going to change. Anyway. Um, well, it is certainly no fun the way they're doing it. Um, it's... We could use it. We have had chancellors that did a good job, maybe 15 years ago. But we've had nothing but an endless chain of temps driving the ship off, in, off into the rocks ever since then. And uh, the current guy is living up to exactly what the union said he would do. But anyway, um, it's uh, for, anyway, and that's where we're at. I will let you know if they tell me anything. But I imagine I'm probably not going to be teaching what I think I'm teaching next semester. But Nobody knows what's going on at all. And a bunch of the teachers are not sure they're even going to have a job next semester. I have so much seniority, they can't fire me, but they're going to have to fire an awful lot more people to overcome this shortfall. Yeah. Uh, I have a presentation. Oh, good. Sure. 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 We'll do it tonight. Yeah. Okay. Good. If anybody else needs to present anything tonight, we can. That's fine. Anyway, so, um, all right. And I had one student come to me and said, gee, I, I forgot to do my presentation, but I was on television. I said, well, that'll do. Show me his TV spot. He was on TV for Veteran Tech. And I said, well, you know, I think that counts. <laughs> In fact, he got hired as like a public relations spokesman for a technical program. And I said, well, you know, I'm willing to accept that that amounts to the public speaking requirement of my course. <laughs> that kind of shows that you succeeded at this part of the class. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is, this is like, you know, we had, we had a person taking a web design class here. The elementary web designer was already teaching class far beyond it and working as a professional web designer. And, you know, they're making this person do the homework. And I'm like, you know, there's no real point wasting people's time when they obviously have achieved the goal. Anyway, um, I, I don't know. A bunch of people are timid about breaking rules around here. I think after you get around here long enough, you gain total contempt for the rules. At least I did. Anyway, so um, uh, all right. So we're, here we are. We're going to talk a bit more about this information security management. This seemed very much like uh, ordinary security plus CISSP stuff. Um, anyway, so we're talking about risk management a bit. And uh, it'll, it's pretty simple and won't take too long because it's pretty much uh, more about the same old risk management that we talked about before, with just a few more levels. So the point of risk management is to identify the risks to your company and lower it to acceptable levels and your company at the high levels of management has to decide what your risk appetite is. Banks are famously risk averse. There are banks still using token ring because they just don't want to change anything and they have a system that's 20 years old and it's good enough and they don't see any reason to rock the boat. And that's the way banks tend to be very, very reluctant to take on any risk because of course you, they take all this money and they want to not lose it. And they don't really care about having the latest thing or the fastest thing or the most efficient thing. They just care about the safest thing that has been used by other people for many years and proven to be safe. But startups, of course, are just trying to get buzz really fast and then get bought out by Google. They really don't care if they do a risky thing and get in trouble. Facebook and Uber and Bird just move fast and break things. It's a whole different attitude. So there you accept a whole lot more risk because what you have to do is make a splash fast before somebody else comes up with an imitation product and erases you. And it really doesn't matter if a few things go wrong on the way. So when you find a risk, you can accept it. You do nothing, just let it happen. Or you can avoid it by canceling that part of your business entirely so you don't take that risk anymore. But most of the time, you mitigate or transfer. Um, you mitigate it by putting in some kind of defense to lower it, and you transfer it by shoveling it off to somebody else like an insurance company or a business partner to handle that so somebody else takes on the risk. So risk management program just figures out how to organize that process. So you define what you want to protect, and then 
your objectives and your scope is what part of the business you're protecting. You make sure you have authority from some top level management because you're going to have to have resources, people and money, and you're gonna be able to meet people that show up to meetings and fill out forms and stuff. And you have to have staff and you have to define their roles and responsibilities. And then you have to have policies and all these records. It's a big thing, that risk management program. It's expensive and it's a lot of work. And people don't usually do it when they're just starting out. They do it as they become a more mature company. You do it because you want to be respected. You want to do business with big organizations like the military and big corporations that won't touch you unless you actually have all this formality in place because they're not willing to waste time on you. And they often expect you to have established compliance with things like FedRAMP and ISO 27001 and all that jazz. Um, that's what you have to do to play with the big companies at a big scale. So you got, um, you start with asset identification. You actually have to find out where all your stuff is. Then you have to analyze the risks and then you treat it. And then you go around and around and around because everything keeps changing. You keep getting more assets, the risks keep changing and you just have to have a perpetual labor here of constantly improving your risk posture. So you got risk governance, which is the management making sure this really happened and you can prove it really happened. And that integrates with your enterprise risk management system, which is not particularly focused on technology or cybersecurity, but focused on general business risks. And you're doing a cycles of evaluation and response. So uh, first thing you have to do is find your assets. Most small businesses have no idea what assets they have or where they are. They've just sprawled into a bunch of cloud services and people put data all over the place and they don't even really know what all people are using because they don't really have a system where developers have to ask permission and record what they do. They just say, Oh, let's sign up for this. Let's use this until your company's actually using some weird cloud service and management doesn't even know it. That's where you start. And of course that's okay for a startup. It's just trying to get something going, but it's really not okay if you want to be an established business that people trust. So you have to, find all your assets, group them up, um, and then figure out the risk. So you get the probability of a bad thing happening and the impact if it does happen, that's the total risk. Often you can only do it high, medium, low. You can try to have numbers on it, but those numbers are really just educated guesses in most cases. So threats are just a list of all the bad things that might happen, excluding ridiculous things like meteors hitting you, uh, things that have some reasonable chance of happening. You list all the bad things that might happen, strikes, riots, terrorism, malware, hardware and software failures. And a big one is, of course, errors by your staff. Just mistakes your people make is, of course, a huge one, probably the biggest. They call it the insider threat. It's not even necessarily malicious insiders, just people confused and doing the wrong thing still expose your data, cause loss of money. So anyway... Then you have, and now you analyze it. So those natural weather and such, you'd think about geographic factors at each location. You'd think about logical factors for each type of asset. Your servers run Unix, you don't have to worry about Windows viruses, but your laptops run Windows, so you're gonna need something to stop the viruses there. And then you have um, threat analysis for groups when possible, and for individual highly valued assets, you might have an individual threat analysis for that particular object, things that might be a target for that specific object being attacked. Uh, this would be things like intellectual property. The most valuable intellectual property in the world is the source code for Microsoft Office. At least it used to be, and I think it probably still is. And they protect it very much. And that's something you do if you have some highly valued thing like that. So the problem is nobody really knows what the probability is of these things happening. And nobody really knows how much harm it would do. Even the most common scary thing, if you have a breach and you lose all your customer data with credit cards, there is no way to say how much that will cost you. Real breaches have ended up costing $200 per record and other breaches have ended up costing 50 cents per record. That's a really big spread. I don't understand how anybody can sell insurance when you can't predict the loss of a breach even within a factor of 100. But people make guesses. And you know, other things have been around for a while, like cars and airplanes and humans dying of diseases. We have real records for those and the insurance companies have actuarial tables and they can very accurately predict how much money it's, how often those bad things are going to happen. But in the cyber world, Nobody has much clue how to predict it all because it keeps changing really fast. So anyway, yeah. Oh, a bunch of them. Gone yeah. Bust? Uh, not the ones that gone bust years? yet. But what what I have a bunch of people now have cyber risk and cyber insurance, and mostly they get hit by ransomware, and then they argue about getting paid off. And what mostly find out is they can pay off quickly from the insurance companies with no problem. A few of them have claimed that they are exceptions to the policy, and that's not covered. I haven't heard of anybody going broke yet. 
So I'm guessing that means they are charging enough to cover it right now. But I wouldn't want to be the guy taking on that risk. Because, I mean, one of those incidents could cost a whole lot of money. And then they'd ask you, why didn't you charge enough? And how did you predict how much money to charge? And I say, man, I just rolled dice. I have no clue how much we should be charging these people. <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, here's bad things you might have. Your antivirus isn't good. Your software is not up to date. You got on password, you got not enough encryption. You don't have enough monitoring of your event logs. You know, all these things are probably true. Most companies, even the military, even everybody, uh, they can't really do everything they should do. And all these good things you're not doing are vulnerabilities. You can try to rank them. There's a famous system called the CVSS score that ranks them from zero to 10. And here's a listing of all the current known vulnerabilities. You can find it online, the CVE details, and you see the tens are the most dangerous ones. And they rate it on many categories, like um, does it let you get root permission? Does it let you exploit the server remotely? And so on. But they try and rate it here. And of course, that's just a number from one to 10. It doesn't quickly tie into real dollar amounts or anything, but it is some attempt to rate how dangerous vulnerabilities are. A lot of people have great arguments with this system and claim it's, it's not very accurate and you shouldn't really count them. Another thing people do is count how many vulns there are per year and then try to rate this product is good because it didn't have very many vulns reported. This product is junk because it had a lot of vulnerabilities reported. And once again, people argue greatly that that's not fair at all. Some products are being investigated more carefully and those vulnerabilities didn't really matter and other people aren't even looking. Anyway, it's, it's, it, it exposes the thing I've mentioned before. This, this is more of an art than a science. We really don't know what we're doing. We really can't calculate how much good training your staff does, how much good putting in better security does in your network. We suppose more highly trained staff and more careful procedures like we're describing will make you safer, but we cannot prove it. It would be nice to say the companies that did this only lost this much, the companies that didn't lost that much, and here's how much money we saved you. But like we're saying, that's what everybody would like, and we totally don't have it. Things keep changing so fast that we don't have like 10 or 20 years of history so we can get those statistics. So you figure out how likely it is the threat will be realized. And again, you're probably just guessing about that. And then you figure out the impact analysis, which I mentioned is kind of guessing in the viewpoints of data breach. But of course, if you're gonna consider a physical thing like the building burning down or people losing your laptop and just having to replace the laptop, then it's pretty easy to figure out how much that would cost. But a data breach has indirect costs that are hard to estimate. Anyway, so you figure out um, what's going to happen to your business. Yeah. yeah. I've been this last night and I started to get a little confused. Yeah. Because all of this talks about what you're talking about, educated guesses. Yeah. You know, you don't, you don't really know if this is going to happen. Yep. Isn't that directly analogous to you don't know what kind of stuff you need to put into your system? I mean, well, I think it is. Secure? Well, I mean, isn't that that's right. A direct reflection of. Well, it is, and that's the problem. I mean, people have long ago, their MBAs of the world have figured out how to run a business. If you consider like opening a new office or buying advertising, you figure out how much it'll cost and how much money you'll make, and that's how they make the decision. And they want to do that with cyber, and they really can't. It's very frustrating. So until recently, they sold all cyber things by fear. Oh, we could get breached. That would be awful. Give us a pile of money. And they did that for a while. Now they're saying, wait a minute. That's not a good enough argument. I want to know how much money to give you. I want to know how much benefit I'm getting from that money. And people are trying to develop scores for that. It's all in its infancy. But that's the problem. It's done by intuition. So, it's, yeah. so that means then that designing the system is done by intuition. Yes, that's the problem. That's why I say this is an art and not a science. Uh, you put in what seem like good practices. You encrypt your stuff. You use modern authentication protocol. You put on your updates. You put on some firewalls and stuff. And then you still get hacked. So now what? Uh, it's, it's a problem, but the fact is we're in war. Things are changing fast. It's, um, this is true of many things. This is true of exciting businesses. You're, if you're an established business like banking, then you can predict what's going to happen, and it's kind of dull for that reason. If you're in the front lines of a war, then you're just guessing. You're dodging the bullets, and you, it's only 20 years from now somebody will decide you were doing it all wrong. At the moment, you don't have time to think about it. You do what you have to do. <laughs> That's where we're at. Yeah. Anyway, um, but this is, of course, the MBAs of the world trying to come in with business logic and procedures and formality to try to make sense of it. But you know, that's why a lot of people get real mad about this stuff. Um, I think it's easier then to teach hacking versus 
security of the system? Well, they're completely different. I mean, red teaming is much easier. Learning how to hack into something is fun and easy, but ultimately unproductive. Protecting things is much harder, and it's sort of frustrating and dull. It mostly consists of trying to limit the amount of stupid mistakes people make. And you try to have some kind of system to detect how many known vulnerabilities are out there. If you listen to Paul Security Weekly, a very good podcast, they're all about these people doing this. And they're trying to build some kind of software to keep track of how many people have not updated their stuff. And they say, you know, we, we accept lowering the number of known problems down to 70% of what it was. And we call that better. And of course, you could argue that doesn't make any sense at all, right? If I have a company lock the doors of the building and they leave one door unlocked, then they might as well leave them all unlocked because anybody will just walk around and try them all. So really what good is that? But it's all you can do. So you do it. And then you tell people I've lowered the risk. But what was that? Paul's, Paul's Security Weekly. Paul's very, Security. Yeah, Paul Asadorin, very famous. Yeah, good one to listen to. It's all these high level, big company security professionals talking about what they do. And it's kind of exposing the secret. I mean, it's, that's what the military does, that's what everybody does. It's a problem. You can't have any perfect security and what you really get is a whole lot less secure than people imagine it is. That's why everybody keeps getting hacked. So you got qualitative risk analysis, you know, just rate things on a scale from one to 10 or something. And you often do that and that's really all you can do. Sometimes you can get a quantitative risk for very simple things. Then you can take the value of an asset and the exposure factor, which is how much of the asset I'll lose. So if you have something like laptops and you're only worried about the hardware, then you know how much it will cost to replace them. And if they get stolen, it's all gone. So the exposure factor is hundred percent. Then you can figure out how many, how often that's going to happen and how many total dollars per year you'll lose from physical theft of your hardware. So for a simple thing like that, you can reasonably decide how much money you'd be worth paying for some kind of countermeasure. Um, so that's fine. Just the fact is your really important risks realistically are things like the laws changing to change taxation or management of your company or new compliance requirements like the California privacy law or the European privacy law that totally change what you have to do or a competitor coming up with a product that replaces yours and suddenly nobody wants it anymore. Those are big risks and those are hard to guess. And that's what really matters. And that's why, you know, your security people would say, I found an encryption flaw and nobody will listen to me. They feel all abused, but it's entirely possible that people up in management have got bigger problems than your little encryption flaw. Like Google's bringing out a product next month that's going to make us obsolete. That's, there's other things going on that really matter. Anyway, then you got business continuity planning. This is how you plan for disasters like floods and fires and stuff. And we talked about that. It's the same as any other risk analysis. Um, and there are high impact events. Um, there are big things that could crush the company entirely. And you have to make sure that planning for that goes all the way to the top. This, the top executives must be in on that if you're considering uh, extinction level events for your company. Um, so, uh, and you get things like uh, one of the big financial companies got hacked, Equifax, I think. It was because they, uh, somebody didn't put a patch on a server that was a known patch. And you know, that was basically a huge problem for the company. And he tried to blame like the junior staff that didn't put on the patch. And like I say, you can't do that. You can outsource work, but you can't outsource responsibility. If you're in charge, you're responsible for what happens on your watch. Just like the president is responsible for what the military does. He's in charge. And if you didn't make sure it was being done right, then that was your failure. You were supposed to have management below. You were supposed to review their work. You were supposed to train people, hire the right people, review their work. You know, whatever stupid things they do is ultimately your responsibility. Um, and anyway, that's, that's tough. Anyway, so there are some guidelines for this. NIST has their standard and ISO has their standard as part of the 27,000. These are compliance frameworks for these risk analyses. Um, and then, of course, yeah. Another guy that came in to see me. Yeah. Warren, you should take classes here. Yeah. He is a um, compliance and governance for a medical device company that yeah. software that those use. And he, he travels four hours a day from here down to Park City. And he carries those manuals with him. Oh, yeah, yeah. This big, yeah, I'm in the background. Yeah. This big, eight and a half by 11. Oh, yeah. He just reads them the whole time. It's like being a lawyer. I mean, it's a really big deal. And, and the, if you have to obey these things, they open certain doors. That's why, you know, once, like dealing with the military, military contractor, which I'm now doing, 
it's a big deal to get in. And once you're in, you're kind of in forever because it's hard for anybody to get in. You don't have a lot of choice. And so these are really expensive to do. And once you've done them, then you're in a small club of people who are eligible for those big contracts. So people work hard to do it. Anyway, um, so, yeah. And when you get those, one of these or both, yeah. you're, you're in with the government for a long time. Well, you're in you with a certain, them? well, these, well, you have to, there's a whole lot of work to maintain them. That's right. It's, it's, I've heard it them say it, it's the ISO 27,000 certification takes typically four years and costs millions of dollars. And then it costs forever going forward because you have to have everybody filling out forms and doing compliance reports and having audits. There's a whole lot of work to maintain it. And so, you know, you have to gear up your company and you have a bunch of management people shuffling paper around just to maintain this and constant reports. And so you would only do it if you have a customer that will pay you a pile of money for being at that level. Do I have to make 60 bucks an hour doing that? 60 bucks an hour, that doesn't sound like enough at all. But, really? um, but anyway, maybe he'll do better. But, it's, well, but anyway, yeah, but certainly, I mean, there's a huge market for compliance. It is worth it for a lot of companies to achieve these things and maintain them to move forward. Just like individuals who get something like CISSP and maintain it because it opens doors. Um, it's a similar issue. Anyway, so then you got risk treatments, of course. Um, so first, one question is who decides what you're going to do about risk treatment? One common thing is the security manager makes all the decision, but what people found out is that doesn't work because the security manager doesn't really know what everybody's doing. So I'll make a decision like everybody has to change their password every 30 days. And there's a bunch of people that are really not okay with that, or that messes up their life. And he doesn't, if you just make decisions like this from security manager, then you get people that hate you. Everyone says that idiot's just always messing up my workflow. Um, so it's better if you have a steering committee where stakeholders from various parts of the business can come express what their objections and you can choose a security policy that will not mess up any important part of the business. That's much better. Of course, a lot of companies just don't have any efficient plan at all. It's not really clear who makes decisions or who's driving the boat like this place. And so, you know, it's uh, that's what immature companies do. Yeah. I really going to keep going back to the yeah. other two. Uh, yeah, these two, yeah. Uh, what, uh, is it easy to get this standard revoked? Is, how easy is it to get it revoked? Oh, uh, oh uh, I don't know exactly how you get it revoked, but I, I know about PCI DSS. You have to be audited. If you have a small amount of credit cards, you just fill out a form and they don't check anything. But if you ever get hacked, or if you do more than like half a million transactions per year, then you're at the top level. And then you have to pay for an official auditor to come in and do a pen test every year and audit your stuff. And if you fail to be in compliance, they don't throw you out right away. They put you on like a blacklist and give you a demerit and say you have like two years to straighten out. Because, and so you have like a recovery plan. But if you stay out of compliance for like two years, three years, then they kick you out. And so it's, um, I assume it's similar for all these. I mean, once you're in, they don't just kick you out for one bad audit, but you have requirements to clean up this and that. And if you don't do it, then eventually they'll kick you out. And uh, like those, like OSCP, CERSA, and uh, CISA, and the CISM, like this one, yeah. and the CISSP, can these smaller shirts be revoked by the, by the company who issues them? Uh, yes. All of these certs can be revoked either by failure to pay your dues or failure to submit your continuing education requirements or by unethical conduct. There can be protests to revoke them from the CISSP you can lose for that. So yes, you can lose your certs. Um, most common thing is you just don't pay the fee. You know, some of you have to take a retest every few years. And if you don't do that, then it becomes expired, which is true of most of mine. The only one I maintain is the CISSP. Just like everybody else. Oh, okay. And it depends on the, which certs you have. Each cert has different rules, yeah. Yeah. Oh. These are good points. I see a chat coming in. And I'll get to it if I can figure out how to operate my computer. There we go. Yeah, so it's a remediation period of six months. Good, yeah, where you get retested in order to stay compliant. Good, thank you. That's what Carrie says. Good, she knows more about it than me. Anyway, so that's good. So I mean, that's what I thought. They don't just kick you out the moment you fail, because of course it was a huge job to get in and they don't want to lose you. They want you to clean up. This is why when the college, was accused, well, lost it, was threatened to lose our accreditation. We protested on the very reasonable grounds that the report that said we weren't good enough had no remediation strategy at all. They just wanted to shut us down. It was just a corrupt hatchet job. Any serious failure to achieve some certification comes with a remediation. Well, here's what, right, here's what you have to do. Otherwise, it's ridiculous. I mean, they're not, they don't just throw you out. 
they tell you what the problem is and they tell you, all right, you have like six months or a year to fix it. And then if you don't do that, then maybe they throw it out. But I mean, they tried to just throw us out with nothing, with no pretense that it was anything other than just throwing us out. And that was not okay. And we got that reversed. Thank you, Sam. And thank you, Carrie. Oh yeah, very good. Yeah, good. It's very good stuff. So anyway, um, you, after you do your risk mitigation, you still have residual risk. No matter what you do, nothing is perfect. And so often you have a cost analysis to decide whether lowering it to this level is worth what it costs. And often you'll, and there's risk transfer, of course, like I say, you can buy insurance or hire some business partner to do some risky activity, and then you're trusting them, and they're taking some of the risk. And then, of course, there's risk avoidance, like Dix. Dix just got decided they're gonna stop selling guns. You see, all these people have big shoot-ups of schools and everything, and we don't wanna be responsible. We're just gonna get out of the business. This business is too risky. We're just gonna abandon that business, not gonna sell guns anymore. You can certainly do that. That's an option, you see. This is just not worth it. Um, then there's risk acceptance, where you just do nothing and let it happen. Um, dump, a lot of people do this because they're just stupid and they don't make any plans, but then you can do this in a controlled way. You decide it's really too much bother to prevent this and it doesn't really matter, so you let little things slide. Um, and, but whatever you do, there's residual risk, and you might take the residual risk and subject that to another round of risk treatment. You say, here's the residual risk after we put in firewalls and we still want acceptable, so what are we going to put in in addition to the firewalls to bring it down again? And then, of course, compliance risk. Here is the legal issue. If you're a regulated business, and most of them are by now, if your financial grand lease widely affects you, if you're taking credit cards, it's PCI, DSS, if you're an educational institution, it's FERPA, if you're a medical institute, it's HIPAA, there's a bunch of things that apply to you. And if you don't obey that, it's just like breaking any other law, there are now fines and lawsuits and all that jazz. And that's something we do have some experience how to estimate. We People have been doing legal risk for a long time, and that's an issue. That's your compliance risk. Failures you comply will lead to legal problems. And uh, pretty much everybody has to have a lawyer team because they're constantly getting sued and stuff. And so you just accept that as another cost of doing business. So you should have a risk ledger recording all this stuff. All your risk gas, your risk um, mitigations, what was affected, what you did about them, how well it worked. You have a record of all the things you've done, which people can look at, not only for you to make future plans, but for all these compliance people to look at to see, see, they are doing something about this and that, but they didn't do enough about this, and that's what they have to fix. Um, so you got your, many people start with just a spreadsheet recording all this, but after you get to be bigger, you pay for special software just to do this, governance, risk, and compliance software, which automates all this process of gathering reports from all your services and such every month or something and compiling them all up and having it all ready for auditors to easily get at when they come to audit you, which is totally going to happen. You're going to have a whole series of audits. That's why I say, once you achieve something like 27,000, you have to pay a lot of money per year just to maintain it. You have to do all these documents proving that you are continuing to maintain an appropriately secure posture. So there's security audits, there's two types. A security review is just a less formal, rigorous process to just see what you're doing. And a security audit is typically with a checklist. You must have these things and I must check them off one by one. And then I must submit a formal document that might go to court saying whether you exactly what your security posture is because you know it has to do with your maintaining the certification and may have to do with responding to a lawsuit where people are accusing you of not really meeting the standard. Uh, this happened a lot to cloud vendors. Microsoft has been trying to break into the cloud vendor space. And about four years ago, Microsoft started selling marketing services to city governments, saying, we can put you in the cloud. And Amazon sued and said, Microsoft does not really have FedRAMP certification, which is what you have to have. They just faked it. They don't really need it. And they had a lawsuit saying Microsoft had misrepresented themselves as being sufficiently secure to handle that business when they weren't, only we are. And there was a big lawsuit. I don't know how it came out. But now it's happening again at a big level because the DOD went with Microsoft Azure and Amazon is suing, claiming we should have got that contract. And so there will be a battle. <coughs> but one of the issues there is compliance and there are other issues um, because you cannot, by law, get federal or, or local government business unless you have a certain standard of reporting for it all. So how that turns out. Yeah, we'll see how it comes. I mean, that's why one of, one of the issues with Hillary Clinton's email server was that Anything she put on her private server was not being retained, and there are federal records retention requirements. All the government documents have to be kept in a government place where they can be examined later. And you know, so it is not legal to have 
government business being done on private things that aren't recorded. Um, although at that time, it wasn't entirely clear that, that what she did was exactly breaking a current policy. Certainly, that was another concern where it was fouling up their compliance. Anyway, um, so you got audits. You have to have a systematic process done by the independent person, and they interview your people, they examine all your documents, and they deliver a written opinion assessing the health of your business and whether you are up to standards, just like a legal investigation to see if you're paying your staff the right amount of overtime and all that jazz. So CISA is the cert you get to do this. I really think we should be teaching it here and students should get it. Richard Wu wrote the class. He's been offering to teach it for the last several years, but they never could get it on the schedule. I wouldn't expect it to happen next semester either, but maybe after that, if we get $800 million out of the extremely generous citizens of San Francisco, then we'll have enough money to hire enough teachers to teach this class. I think we should have it. I think like CISM, this is an easy cert to get and worth a lot of money in the, to get a job. Um, being an auditor, is a technical and security job that is not too difficult. It's a little bit boring, but that means you get to go home at five. It's not combat with the bad guys. It's like HR and payroll, it's and taxes. It's a regular job and they pay good money. And I've heard um, security people say that like when they give, I had some security people come give talks and they get questions from the audience about what about work-life balance? And he said, you know, if you want work-life balance, go into the financial industry. They are desperate for security professionals and they can't get enough of them because they all want to be red teamers and half people and exciting. But if you want to actually go home at five, you do not want to be a red teamer and you don't want to be a blue teamer either because then people hack your shoe and you have to go in and take it up. You don't want to be doing the combat at all. You want to be over here in compliance. If you want to go home at five, that's a regular job <laughs> and you can have a home life and, and they're glad to have you because they can't attract enough smart technical people there's, there's a lot of need for that oh yeah there's a ton of a ton of need and compliance and auditing uh, it's not sexy and exciting like red teaming but it's got to be done and what they have is they mostly have like mbas that are mainly business people and not technical people trying to do this having trouble with the technical side they would love to have technical experts over there and anyway so um you got to plan your audit figure out what you're trying to audit how big it is Look at your risk analysis in the past, like it, to see if there's problem areas, you ought to pay attention to those. And then you choose your process and the, the people and resources and have a schedule for your audit. Uh, so you decide whether your controls exist and whether they're effective and often you're comparing it to a legal standard or you're responding to an incident, which is of course extremely common. People get hacked and now you have to have a serious review to try to reassure your customers and overseers and everybody that you've really fixed the problem and it's okay to trust you again. So you can have all kinds of things, test a certain operational part of the company or just the money or mix those two or just the information systems or the administration or compliance. That's where you're comparing it to a defined standard, which by the way is a whole lot less perfect than you might imagine. One thing, um, I've heard, uh, years ago my boss told me in Italy, the tax law is much, much, much more messed up than ours. He said in Italy, the way you pay your taxes is you, your lawyer and the government's lawyer goes out for a drink and they make a deal because nobody can figure out what's going on. <laughs> It's very far from having like a spreadsheet where you put in the numbers and the right number comes out. They like make a deal. Well, we'll settle for this much and then we won't prosecute it or something. And compliance is pretty much that way. It's not as simple as you have to have these things. You have to, like PCI, you have to have 10 things, but you can say you don't have them and explain why and convince them it's all right. Like we don't really need to do that or that would be unreasonable. We have something else we do instead that addresses that. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's not as simple as just checking the boxes and meeting doing exactly these things every company is different yeah there's a job at the airport i think for an analyst job and, yeah and one of the requirements is that CISA service so i'm thinking yeah yeah i'm thinking about that's why absolutely i recommend i mean this that's why i think i was the one to push this through i really wanted us to teach it richard would agree to teach it. he wrote the class and put it on the books um we should have this. This would get students jobs and good jobs. And you don't need to be a super genius. You just need to follow the rules and get them right. You know, it's not, this is, this is easily achievable and worth a lot of money. And I think a lot of students don't really need to be in frontline combat. They'd be happy to get a regular paycheck and do a good thing. Yeah. I, yeah. I remember when I worked in as basically 
a paralegal, I, I got 850 an hour and I was glad to have it. You know, it was not rocket science, but I needed the money. So, you know, I know what it's like. Anyway, so then there's other kind of audits. You have forensic audits where you're preparing a document to go to court because for a lawsuit or something else, that's when you're trying to make your document particularly set up to go to court. So there are special ways you have to preserve the evidence and record everything and stuff. Um, then there's providing your auditing your service providers, which is really important these days because so many people are outsourcing everything. They're using cloud services and somebody else's email and somebody else's data storage until you got your stuff all over the place. So you really ought to be auditing your third party providers to see if they're up to snuff. Now, a lot of people aren't prepared to do an individual audit for themselves, so they settle for like these certifications. Some third party audited them and gave them a certification stamp, and we accept that certification as evidence that they're up to our standards. But you know, if the company's in trouble, like a company I'm aware of, got in trouble and now they're in part of the contract, the customers have the right to audit them, and now their customers are coming in auditing them. So it's, sometimes you have that ability as a customer, Anyway, so and here's one of the standards for this, standards for attestation engagements, SSAE 18. Uh, this is an audit report, which an independent agency does, does, and then they send it to your customers. They can get this thing, which shows that they need a global standard of security assurance. So often you would have a pre-audit. Um, this is at my company, when I, when I worked in a financial company, escrow agency, I was really quite interested. We had internal audits all the time at the end of every case, and I was very impressed. We made sure that we could show exactly what happened. Every penny that came in, every penny that went out, every record that came in, what we did with it all, we had it all tied up. I was very impressed with the accuracy and efficiency of it, and you have to do this. So before you get audited, you want to be tidying up a place. Just like, you know, if your landlord inspects your home, you clean it up first so he doesn't find whatever you're doing that you don't want him seeing. You clean up your act. And so you got an audit, you have formal process, and you have phases. You know, you choose what you're auditing, and what the scope is, and you plan it, and then you perform these audits. And so you have a statement of work, typically agreeing to the price and duration and everything, and you got to have approval of that before you start to make sure they've agreed to pay the bill. And then you have your procedures, people to interview, what to ask them, all the documents to get, all the tools you're going to use, and it's pretty repetitive. It has to be going in a standard way. And then you have a communication plan. You request evidence and get it. You have status reports and status meetings and contact for questions and issues that come up. And always there are issues. Um, I thought was, there was a Monty Python skit I saw years ago. This guy wanted to be a line tamer, and it turned out he was Tim and says he's going to be a claims adjuster. And the thing is, I worked in finance, and it was much more interesting than you would think. It's not repetitive at all. Every company is different. Every person is different. Every lawsuit is different. There are a lot of details in doing something that seems simple, like running a bank. It's a lot more exciting than you might imagine. Anyway, um, so you got to make your reports. got to document things. You have to meet the standards and identify everybody involved. So, and then you wrap it up. You deliver your report. You have a meeting to discuss the report privately with them so you can find out what they think of your service and if they have something to say to you that, that is outside the report. And then you uh, invoice them for your money, archive all the papers because you might be involved in lawsuits. The whole point is you're handling security issues and people are frequently gonna get hacked, they're frequently gonna get sued, they're gonna get acquired, just like any other legal activity, you have to archive it. It is entirely possible that years from now, you will get a request, I want to see that report, and the papers it was based on. Just like doctors, you gotta keep your papers because those might become important years later. Even if you think it's all resolved, something else might happen later. Where if somebody says, I gotta see all that paper, you would be um, not up to your standards if you didn't preserve that paper and have it available when somebody needs to see it. And then this, I was surprised to see this in a book, a post audit follow up. You contact them to make sure what, they, what they're doing afterwards. I would think they just want to get rid of you and not hear from you again, but I think you want to establish a standing relationship with them because if they got one of these things like 27,000 compliance, they just have to have periodic audits and you want to make sure they continue to be a loyal customer. So talk to them, say, how's it going? How are you fixing that stuff? Can I help you? What can I do for you? You know, Maintain a steady relationship with them, just like a doctor, a dentist. You trust them, you keep going back to them over and over because you're going to have steady need for their services. This is good business. And so you've got a bunch of evidence to preserve all these written documents and stuff. And then you've got, um, when you consider the evidence, you consider where it came from, how qualified are the people, 
How objective are they? How current is this evidence? As you try to do it, it's kind of like being a detective. You're trying to decide whether this evidence substantiates the finding or not. And then you observe people in various levels to make sure that they are doing, obeying the security policy, to what extent they are, whether they're actually staying in their lane or whether they're doing other people's work and subverting security controls and such. And there's a thing called a control self-assessment you can do to keep your company in line, which is less formal than an audit, but it goes like this, you know, where you, you assess risks, then you have awareness training, then you have people fill out questionnaires to see if they know what they're doing, and you go back and forth, and I say, it looks like we're gonna be doing something like this for the city of San Francisco. They're probably going to do some kind of training for the, about less than the uh, official certification to try to improve the, uh, the security posture of the government agencies here. So um, it's not all clear yet, but there is saying to be something more or less like what you see here, what we're going to be doing. Anyway, um, Who's gonna do me and Richard, yeah. Um, and and our sure corporation, yeah. They met with us a week or so ago. And uh, so they need somebody to help them, and we may be doing that. But it's not, it's not final yet, but um, they do need a training program. And they said, well, well, you guys can do it. And so we're still working out what it should be, but that's what I think it'll be. Um, I forget the, the guy you met with was one of my students, but we, we met with a couple of people. And uh, so, but they do need to have some kind of training program. And they said, well, maybe you guys can do it. And so we're still working out exactly what it would be, but I think it would kind of resemble that slide there. Anyway, so I got a few cahoots. And that's here. So we got the. Uh, we got the local government job and we got the military job, so both of them are going to get more clear. I just signed the papers today for the military jobs, so that's really happening. So we'll be doing, teaching a whole bunch of classes to serving military people. I'm going to move this to the other side of the room. It looks better in the classroom that way. And I see a chat coming in. Congrats on that. Oh, great. Thanks. Yeah, that's right. Anyway, yeah. Should be good. We'll see what happens. You know, I thought it was kind of funny when I, I was thinking, boy, I'm tired of City College making no sense. I'm sure the U.S. military will be less crazy. I said, boy, I'm, that's hard to believe that. I mean, because U.S. military is famous for, like, jerking you around and having rules that make no sense. But... I'm still thinking they might be less crazy than the college right now. We'll see what happens. <laughs> I did that. In fact, now I have to go take a drug test. I'm watching. You know, I had to take one of my, when I taught in Illinois, I had to take a drug test. You can't teach college in Illinois unless you take a drug test. So I did that. And, yeah, they got a lot of rules. I'll have no trouble passing the drug test, but you know, I. What's that? Are you sure about that? Well, I. I don't believe I'm taking any drugs. I don't even think I'm eating anything funny that would, I guess I'll find out. I passed the last one. I know there's some people that are taking something weird. Yeah, I was going to say, walking on campus, I'm pretty sure you get pot. Well, I certainly hear a lot of, I certainly smell a lot of pot around here. If it's that sensitive, I might fail that, but I'm not smoking it myself. Anyway, uh, all right, NDA all the way. Yeah, I had to sign an NDA. But it didn't mean I couldn't talk about it. I want, I, all it said is I can't reveal proprietary secrets of the company I find out. I said, sure, that's fine. Anyway, all right, so I guess I'll go. Anybody still coming in? Okay, let's give it a shot. Uh, here's the start, okay. Start, I say, there we go. Only three questions, I ran out of strings. Anyway. Um, all right, what is the proper treatment for risk with low impact and low probability? Clearly, you accept it. You don't worry about it. All right. A bad thing that might happen without any measure of its significance. What's that? What's that? They're both the same. Oh, I didn't mean for them to be the same. Anyway, keep going. You're right. That's a mistake. Anyway, 
They're both wrong. However, I didn't mean for them to be the same. That's a mistake when I made it. Anyway, it is threats. Threats, vulnerabilities have a measure. We saw that CVSS score. An impact has a score, but threat is just a bad thing that might happen. The estimates of how important it is are elsewhere in like a, um, a probability and um, impact, but not in the threat itself. All right. And what kind of audit is a preparation for court appearance? Okay, that's a forensic audit. Good. All right. So we got some winners. This is 160. And there's 12, 2, 19. Oh, they have animation. Oh, uh, they added. Yes. And three for Captain okay. Caitlin. Okay, good. And C Cap. Good. Three for C Cap. And that's three for Caitlin. Good. And. There you are. Yeah, yeah. They made it. They improved their product. All right. So uh, it's about seven. Let's take a break till 10 after seven. And then I will see if people want to give it a final. We have at least one presentation. I'm going to stop the recording. Well, they'll leave the share going in case anybody has questions. You're